we're going to talk a little bit about CBD analyses. And this is normally a uh, upwards of four or five day course that the Army Corps presents uh, through our prospect course uh, series. So I'm condensed it down into a couple hours. So if you don't understand everything that I throw at you, don't worry. This is just kind of an introduction. So we're going to talk a little about estimating the hydraulic conductivity of soils, talk about seepage through soils, describe uh, flow nets. Flow nets are a really good base for understanding seepage, so I want to talk about them. And then we're going to compare flow net analyses to finite element analyses, which is probably what most y'all use these days for performing seepage analyses. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the main governing equations for seepage analyses are Darcy's law, which governs the flow, the um, how water flows through soil, and then the continuity equation, which is the Laplace equation um, of how fluid goes in and out of a model. Um, so uh, typically, when you're looking at Darcy's law, the fluid is water, and the media is soil in seepage analyses. But we can use Darcy's law for other fluids, such as contaminants and other media. Um, instead of soil, we can use rock. Uh, water can flow both through rock, the pores, the pores in rocks, and through fractures in rocks. Um, so you can, it can be applied to multiple situations. Uh, so Darcy's law is shown here. Um, Darcy's law was based on laboratory experiments done in the 1800s in France by Henry Darcy. Uh, it's, uh, water, he looked at water flow through vertical filters, and he came up with this equation which is Q equals KIA times T, the duration of flow, which we normally neglect um, in seepage analyses because we're looking at steady state 99% of the time. So Q is the quantity of discharge through that filter or through that uh, model. K is the hydraulic conductivity, uh, which in um, seepage analyses and in normal everyday course of discussion in geotechnical engineering, we call the permeability. But the true term for that is either the coefficient of permeability or the hydraulic conductivity. So I will use hydraulic conductivity in this discussion. Um, hydraulic gradient is I, so that's the head loss across your model divided by the length over which that head loss occurs, so delta H over delta L. And A is the cross-sectional area through which that flow is occurring. So here's um, just kind of how the discharge velocity is calculated, um, and the, so that's the Darcy velocity or the velocity through the soil, and then the Q, which is the rate of discharge um, that you're looking at here. So these are just a couple more equations. Uh, there's a good derivation of Darcy's law in our seepage EM, which is EM 1110-2-1901. Um, so if you have uh, questions about that, that's a good uh, reference to look through. There's also a seepage textbook called um, Seepage and Seepage Drainage and Flow Nets, written by Harry Cedergren. Um, that's considered kind of the seminal work in seepage analyses. So those are two good ones to look at. So talking about Darcy's Law, there are some limitations to Darcy's Law. You must have laminar flow. You can't have turbulent flow because turbulence messes up the equations and the calculations. Um, it alters the permeability. Um, it alters the flow rate. So you can't you can't have that. Um, it must be saturated flow. Again, if you have partially saturated soils, permeabilities change, flow rates change. So uh, Darcy's law no longer is applicable. Um, we look at steady state flow. When you start getting into transient flow, that alters the equation as well, and you're looking at um, more along with Plotz's equation and um, more higher order evaluations. Uh, um, in Darcy's law, you're looking at a homogeneous media, which is absolutely not what you have in reality. So uh, there are some corrections that we do to make Darcy's law apply. Um, that Darcy velocity we're talking about isn't really a real flow velocity, it's kind of an average velocity. I'll show a figure coming up next of what Darcy's velocity is versus the actual flow path. Um, and then K is the hydraulic conductivity which has been developed to fit the formulation of Darcy's law. Um, so it, it's useful for this. Uh, and it's a measure of soil properties, but it's, it's used in specifically for Darcy's law. Uh, so here's kind of the uh, how water really flows through the soil. It'll go through those pore spaces in and around grains, but we take a look at an average linear flow path when we do our evaluations. 
Uh, so the other governing equation is Laplace's equation, and we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to uh, Flonex. Um, so here's that general differential equation. Um, the water in equals water out, flow in equals flow out in all directions. So you can see, let me pull up my laser pointer. Um, the change in flow in U over the change in your X direction plus the change in flow in your Y direction over your change in your Y distance is equal to zero. Um, when you apply Darcy's law to that and plug that into the equation, you get this uh, 2D dimensional, 2D differential equation, and you can also extend that to three dimensions if you're looking at 3D seepage, which I don't recommend you do if you don't have a good reason to, because it's not fun. Um, so uh, this is a very basic derivation of Laplace's equation. If you want a more detailed derivation and discussion, as I mentioned, there's uh, Cedergren's textbook, and then actually the USACE uh, engineer manual, uh, 1901, is also a very good guidance on that. It has a really good derivation. So the first thing we'll talk about is hydraulic conductivity, because having an understanding of hydraulic conductivity is kind of the most important um, step in performing a seepage analysis. Um, hydraulic conductivity is one of the hardest material properties to pin down in geotechnical engineering. Um, it's a function of grain size, uh, soil structure, the density of your soil, whether or not there are any discontinuities in your soil mass, what does the stratification of your soil deposit look like? Uh, viscosity of your fluid is also important. However, in most of our analyses, we're looking at just plain old water. Um, so, and, and water, the temperature of the water doesn't change dramatically underground either. So, the viscosity of the water doesn't change dramatically. Um, but those other properties are uh, can change the hydraulic conductivity dramatically. A small change in density can dramatically increase or reduce your permeability. So um, how do we come up with hydraulic conductivity? Uh, well, you can you can look at empirical estimates. Um, that's most commonly what you're going to do. A lot of times you're not going to have field evaluations. I'm not going to talk too much about the field um, estimates for material for hydraulic conductivity, but you can uh, that's kind of the gold standard um, uh, pumping test. Uh, uh, just kind of uh, fluid flow, stuff like that. But uh, a lot of times you have to work with uh, empirical estimates. Um, you, you might be able to do some lab testing. Lab testing can, um, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later, but lab tests for permeability can also be inaccurate. So uh, we do a lot of uh, comparison to empirical values. So there's published tables that have been developed over the years. And then there's also empirical equations that have been developed over the last uh, century plus to evaluate hydraulic conductivity. Um, so here's just a look at a chart from one of Cassie Grande's uh, papers. Uh, you can see the wide range of permeability. So it goes from um, 10 centimeters per second all the way down to 10 to the minus 9 centimeters per second. So multiple orders of magnitude. Um, and here this chart shows different soil types that you can um, compare to the different uh, permeabilities. So it goes from clean gravels down to what uh, people might call practically impervious soils. Uh, we're big fans of saying impervious in the Army Corps uh, for our low permeability soils. Um, and that's kind of, if you're going down to, to a, a 10 to the minus eight centimeters per second, you're looking at a clay that has no, no sand, no, um, no discontinuities, no layering, nothing like that. So um, you can get as low as that uh, permeability. Um, and then it talks about uh, this, this chart is really helpful because it kind of gives you uh, field tests that you can perform, lab tests that you can perform, um, some indirect determinations of permeability from grain size distributions, uh, falling head permeability tests, stuff like that. So this is, this is a good chart to help kind of test your way through how to maybe you can come up with a permeability value for your for your analysis. Um, here's another chart. I like this chart because it you can look at multiple different types of units. Uh, so most of the time we see centimeters per second for permeabilities or hydraulic conductivities. Um, but when you're looking at putting it into a seepage model, most of the time you're working in feet and and maybe feet and days, feet and minutes. 
feet per second. So this helps you compare. Um, so you, you're told you have a material of 10 to the minus three centimeters per second permeability. What is that in, in feet per day, feet per minute, stuff like that. And um, it also tells you soil types with the USCS classification. So that helps out with that. Uh, another useful um, stuff you can look into. Uh, so a lot of the government documents nowadays have tables of hydraulic conductivity that they've compiled. Uh, NRCS has this one um, for uh, you can get down, you can get into pretty high percent fines, pretty high PIs, um, and it kind of gives you kind of a range to start with and gives you a, a range of permeability to, to at least get going on your seepage analysis. Um, one of the best ones, I think, is Reclamation compiled um, multiple tables in their most recent seepage guidance. Um, they did, uh, they've done it based on uh, both man-made, man, man man-compacted soils and natural soils. So this one is hydraulic conductivities of embankment cores, and they've compiled from a number of different sources. You can see um, Reclamation lab data, but also data from different sources um, throughout the last, you know, 50 years. Uh, so they did it based on USDS classification, and they looked for, in this case, vertical hydraulic conductivity um, because they were looking mostly at lab test data. Um, they did the same thing for embankment shell materials, so the coarser grain materials you might find in an embankment. Um, same thing, they uh, data from various sources throughout the last 50 years. And then they also did what I think is even more helpful. Um, they looked at horizontal hydraulic conductivities of natural soil deposits. Um, so this is, you're going to be looking at your foundation. In most cases, uh, soil is going to be moved, uh, water is going to be moving through your soil horizontally underneath your embankment. So uh, they looked at those horizontal hydraulic conductivities, which tend to control your analyses. Uh, and this, again, this one is all kinds of data, um, including um, stuff from PEC, uh, Army Corps, uh, all the way back to uh, Hazen, uh, who developed material properties and developed uh, permeability equations back in the early 1900s. So those are kind of um, published data values, published tables you can take a look at. Um, there's also empirical equations. These uh, are very limited in use. They generally have a, a small range over which of the material types they can be used to evaluate. You can't use uh, one equation can only be used for, say, this type of sand. It can't be used for gravels or clays. So they do have very limited uses, but they do are very helpful to help you kind of understand and get a, get a general idea of material properties. Um, so uh, beginning with Hazen in the late 1800s, he did uh, work from like 1890s to the early 19, like I think he published his last publication was in 1911. Um, they recognized that hydraulic conductivity was related to the fine fraction of the soil. So Hazen himself developed equations for K being proportional to the D10 of the material. And I'll show you D10 in a minute, um, what that means. And then these equations that he developed were then modified to reflect effects of void ratio, porosity, angularity of the soil, stuff like that. Um, so, uh, D10 uh, is the grain size at which 10% of the soil sample by weight is finer than that grain size. So, taking a look at this example, um, you plot up your grain size analysis, uh, results of your grain size analysis, um, and you look at the percent finer um, at 10% go over, and in this case, D10 is uh, 0.15 millimeters. So, that's what you plug into equations making sure you're using the right units because these are empirical equations, so um, you need to have the correct units. So um, I mentioned that they have altered Hazen's equation for void ratio and porosity. Void ratio and porosity of soil heavily influences the hydraulic conductivity of the soil because void ratio and porosity are a measure of the voids in the soil. So they tell you how much space there is for water to move through your soil. So void ratio is defined as the volume of voids over the volume of solids. Uh, porosity is defined as the volume of voids over the total volume of your soil sample. Um, and then you can see the uh, 
correlations between porosity and void ratio. So they're, they're very related to each other, as you can tell from the actual equations um, for what they mean. So we'll start with Hazen's equation because it's the easiest one. Um, the presentations that were posted on uh, the Army Corps web or the, the RMC website, I noticed yesterday had an error in this slide right here. Um, the, uh, I'll walk through this equation and I'll tell you where the error was. But um, so Hazen's equation is K, your permeability is equal to a constant C value times your D10 squared. And D10 in this case is in millimeters in this example. Um, so to get your permeability in centimeters per second, your constant value ranges between 0.4 and 1.5. Most of the time it's taken as one because as geotechnical engineers, we like nice round numbers and in that case, C just doesn't exist. Um, so we can take it to one. So that's where the error was in this case. Um, C I had as 0 0.04 and 0 0.15. This is the correct numbers. And you can see on the next slide, I have um, some variations of C for this method that have been recommended. Um, this is applicable only to D10s between 0.1 and 0.3 millimeters. There should be a millimeters there. Um, and it assumes that your sand is pretty loose. Um, and we'll talk about how you can alt how you can adjust Hazen's equation for much more dense sands. Um, so this is gonna go into the new uh, EM1901. Uh, these are suggested ranges. As you can see, they're still pretty large ranges. And again, um, a lot of times people assume just one for your C value. So it goes away. So as I mentioned, that's for a pretty loose soil. Um, so over time, researchers have modified Hazen's equation based on additional research that have been done. So here's a modification to you can apply and extend Hazen's equation to sand with a lower void ratio or a sand that's denser than expected, um, and that was used in Hazen's uh, experiments. So here's the relationship between hydraulic conductivities and void ratios. So um, this is just uh, your you have one hydraulic conductivity and the second hydraulic conductivity. You have the void ratio for your H your K1 and your void ratio for K2. Um, rearranging all that fun equation, um, and then you get this equation of K2 is equal to K1 times a bunch of calculations with your void ratios. So plugging that into uh, dense and loose, um, uh, mod uh, Hazen's equation has been modified, so your, your dense permeability is equal to your Hazen permeability times your uh, dense and you have your dense void ratio and your looser void ratio. That looser void ratio is your Hazen void ratio. Um, so that loose is your void ratio at your minimum density, um, whatever the minimum density for the soil is. Um, usually that's around 0.75, or you can test and come up with whatever your loosest void ratio is if you have that ability to do so. Um, and then the dense void ratio is uh, usually 0.4 or less. Uh, some, uh, so I'm going to go through a few methods for a, a few additional methods for calculating uh, permeabilities based upon uh, equations. So, uh, 1915 publication by Charles uh, Schlichter, I think is how it's pronounced, um, had different tables of permeabilities and void ratio and um, uh, material properties, uh, D10s. So Danny McCook, uh, who worked for NRCS and did a ton of filter testing and permeability evaluations, NRCS was kind of a leader in that, uh, particularly in the 80s, um, when we still use their data today. Um, he took that, he took those table values and turned them into a best fit equation. Uh, these, uh, this best fit equation is applicable for D10s between 0 0.01 and 5 millimeters. So here's that equation. Um, so You've got the porosity up here in your uh, exponent. Um, this E here is not the void ratio. It's the natural log, natural log of this um, equation here. Um, and you use D10 in millimeters. So it's again, it's a D10 equation. Uh, another equation is Chef Wee. Um, he, in this case, E is the void ratio. 
Um, so not to be confusing in the slightest, um, but he's based on void ratio and your D10 again. Um, and then one of the more common ones uh, these days is the kozani carmen relationship. Uh, this was published most recently by Carrier in 2003. It's, um, it takes a look at the uh, um, whole range of soils that you have in your uh, gradation band, um, and then it also takes a look at a shape factor, so the angularity of your soil. Um, so I'll, I'll walk through what these all these are, but this is uh, F sub I is the fraction of particles between two adjacent sieves. And then those two sieve sizes are shown here. Um, this is the larger sieve size, particle size, and then the smaller sieve particle size. And you just do that calculation between every sieve size on your gradation band. Um, so it's a summation of all of those values. And then the shape factor, um, as I'll show in the next slide, ranges from six for rounded soils to eight for more angular soils. So six is maybe more of an alluvial soil um, collected from a, a riverbed. Angular might be a crushed soil from a, um, um, a crusher plant. Um, so here's all those variables. Uh, so like I said, this is one of the more commonly used ones. Um, some of the advantages to this is it considers void, void ratio and angularity, and it considers your entire gradation, not just your D10. Um, but it does take a little more work to calculate, um, and um, it may overemphasize the effects of any fine clay particles you have in it. So if you have a lot of fines down near the bottom of your gradation, that can cause some problems with the evaluation. And again, this is really only applicable to sandy soils um, so it also has a limited use as well. So whether or not it's any better is, is hard to tell. Um, so as I mentioned, the NRCS did a ton of work in the 80s on filter compatibility evaluations, um, and Greg will talk about filter compatibility later in this uh, course, I think later today. Um, but in addition to doing filter evaluations for a bunch of different soils, they also measured the permeability of those soils. So uh, they were able to plot those results. Um, they plotted those in their Soil Mechanics Note 9, published in 1984. Um, and here's that relationship. So they, they actually plotted permeability versus D15, the slight change. Um, and again, this is only applicable to those soils that they plotted. So you can see the D15s that they have in the D15 range you're looking at. It's about, you know, in this case, you're looking about 0.1 to 5 millimeters again. So, but this is another useful equation. They have minimum, maximum, and kind of your, your mean range here that they had. Uh, one final relationship. This one is between uh, hydraulic conductivity and the D20 of the material. Again, data was in tabular form, in table form in the textbook, uh, and it was converted to a best fit equation that I'll show on the next slide. Uh, this method is really suited to poorly graded sands, um, so with a D10 not much smaller than a D20, so poorly graded means a pretty steep gradation curve. Um, and you can see the applicable range of mil uh, gradations for the D20, uh, 0.005 and 2, so you're still looking at kind of fine sands. Here's that best fit equation, so D20 on the uh, x-axis and, and permeability on the y-axis. And then just here's that best fit equation for you. So I put all this information down um, into this presentation just to give you one stop shop for at least a few equations to start with if you're doing a seepage analysis. So if you've done a permeability or if you've done a filter compatibility evaluation, any dam design in the past, um, you probably know that C33 fine aggregate um, or C33 fine sand is one of the most commonly used materials in dam construction. Uh, it's developed and mostly used for uh, concrete aggregate, but we have found, as geotechnical engineers, we like to use what we can find. Uh, it's found to be a really good filter for many fine grain base cells you would encounter in most existing dams um, and then in a lot of dam foundations that we deal with. So um, that's Usually the first material I start with when I'm doing a filter compatibility evaluation, and uh, Greg will go through that um, in pretty pretty much de in a pretty good detail later. 
Um, so uh, Danny McCook, uh, when he was doing a presentation on, uh, CB, uh, on permeability evaluations and permeability estimates, he took um, C33 fine aggregate, the, the, C, the fine side, this red band here for C33 stand, and he calculated the permeability using a number of different um, empirical equations that I just talked about and calculated the permeability from those. So you can see um, it looks like a pretty big range, right? You know, anywhere from two to 33 feet per day. Um, but that's kind of in the same order of magnitude overall. So um, you're, you're getting reasonable approximations from all your equations. Uh, and that's probably about the best we can do for hydraulic conductivity anyways. Um, so, uh, if you're using these equations on a soil that's applicable to that method, you're going to get a reasonable approximation of your permeability. All right, so now we've talked about hydraulic conductivity, uh, how to calculate it, how to estimate it. Um, we really so far talked about it as just a single value, right? Now. There's probably not many soils out there where the hydraulic conductivity is a single value for the entire deposit or even the entire layer, um, which really complicates seepage analyses. Um, so the permeability can vary as a function of your position in the soil, either horizontal, vertical, whatever. Um, so a homogeneous soil, your permeability is constant for anywhere in the soil. Um, but in most cases, you'll have maybe a layered heterogeneity. So layered, um, that means, you know, there's probably like clays and sands and different materials throughout your soil. Um, there's the discontinuous heterogeneity. So you might have pockets of sand in your clay, something like that. Um, trending heterogeneity, for example, could mean that um, I've seen this in sand aquifers along rivers beneath levees. The hydraulic conductivity increases with depths below it, you have a, your gradation gets um, larger as you go down, you get coarser soils as you go down, so your permeability gets higher as you go down in your sand deposit. Um, so in addition to heterogeneity, you have anisotropy, uh, where your permeability is a function of your X direction or your Y direction. So isotropic soils um, is a soil that has a permeability that's uh, constant in all directions and the same in all directions. But I don't know if I've ever seen a soil that behaves like that. Um, in general, your X permeability is not equal to your Y permeability is not equal to your Z permeability. Um, and in most cases, uh, the horizontal hydraulic conductivity will be greater than your vertical hydraulic conductivity um, due to the fact that in most cases in nature, materials are deposited in horizontal layers. Um, and then embankments, we construct our embankments in horizontal layers most of the time. So. There's, of course, exceptions to all rules, but in most cases, that's what you'll find. So I thought this was kind of a cool um, graphic to show what uh, the different types of uh, relationship between a heterogeneous and isotropic soil. So um, in the first example here, this is a homogeneous isotropic soil. So your permeability is the same at both X1 and X2, and your permeability is the same in the KZ and KX directions, or the KX and KY directions, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then this shows homogeneous soils, so the permeabilities are the same at this location, but they're anisotropic, so they're different permeabilities in the two different directions. Um, here's one where they're isotropic, so they're, the permeabilities are the same in both directions, but soil is heterogeneous, so you have different permeabilities at different locations. And then what you probably have is a heterogeneous anisotropic soil. The permeabilities are different in each location and they're different in each direction. So good way to complicate your analysis. Um, so in some cases, you may want to create an equivalent hydraulic conductivity to represent a layered system. This is very common if you're doing a blanket theory evaluation on a levy. I don't know if you guys have had experience with doing that, um, but if you work for the core and have done a levy evaluation, you probably have. Um, so these are the two equations you can use for vertical and horizontal hydraulic conductivity. And I'll just show you the derivation for vertical hydraulic conductivity on the next slide. Um, but it's basically a compilation of um, the overall thickness of your layer, 
and then a summation of the thickness of your, each individual layer, of each individual permeability, and the permeability of that layer. And in the case of vertical calculations, you divide, and in the case of horizontal calculations, you multiply those values together. So, so here's just the derivation of the vertical um, equivalent horizontal, vertical equivalent vertical hydraulic conductivity. I can explain that. There's a lot of um, uh, letters there. Um, so basically, your vertical hydraulic conductivity or vertical um, flow. So the V is your vertical flow flow rate is equal to your vertical hydraulic conductivity times your gradient delta H over D. And then we're assuming A is a unit A at this point, a unit area. So um, then you split it into the different um, layers. So you have the same equation, but applied to each layer. Um, and then your overall uh, head loss uh, or change in head is equal to the sum of the head across, change in head across each layer. And then your flow rate, because it's going through each of these layers, the flow rate's not going to change. Your overall flow rate's going to be the same. Um, so that's how we get that equivalency. So playing around with all these values, and since it's, you know, 8.45 in the morning, I'm not going to go through the equation, but um, you can take a look at this on your own if you'd like, um, just to see how that's derived. And there's a similar derivation for the horizontal hydraulic conductivity. All right, so alluvial soils, um, as I mentioned, are often, or our soils are often highly stratified. Um, alluvial soils in particular can um, be highly stratified and have high anisotropy. So what that means is that um, if you take a look at this evaluation, you have uh, a silty clay layer, or this picture, this, you have a silty clay layer, you have a sandy layer, and you kind of have a gravelly sand mix here. Um, the water flow going through vertically through this is probably going to be um, controlled by the permeability of this silty clay layer. Um, but the flow going horizontally through this layer is probably going to be controlled by your coarser grain gravels and sand layers. So you're going to have different uh, permeabilities. So reclamation being ever helpful. Um, took a look at different uh, material, materials they had in their dams and in their different sites. Um, and they looked at natural soils at, at all their various dam sites. Um, and came up with some ranges that they have for their different formations. Uh, as you can see, these are kind of, can be kind of large. <laughs> so for stratified deposits, your anisotropy can be anywhere between 10 and 1,000. Uh, so it, it's really very dependent upon the layers of your system. So this is a, at the best a guide, at the worst, not particularly useful at all. But it gives you kind of a range to work with so that you know, hey, I have a stratified deposit. My, my anisotropy is probably not one. Um, and I did want to point out that in this case, KH over KV is shown here. Um, in uh, seepage analysis, if you're using, say, steepW, it's going to be the opposite. You're going to look at KV over KH. So make sure you put things correctly into your analysis. Um, I'm speaking from experience. That's tripped me up more than a few times. Uh, so now we'll take a look at different uh, different things that can change your anisotropy um, and hydraulic conductivity. Uh, so this is a cool figure, I thought, um, because it shows you how uh, Water con how the change in water content and the change in compaction as you compact a soil affects the structure of uh, your clay. This is compacted clay in particular. Clay is heavily affected by compaction. Um, so uh, we, we're going to take a look at flocculated versus dispersed. So a, a flocculated structure, you can see the clay particles are kind of all over the place and they're spread out. Um, dispersed, they're, they've been kind of laid out in horizontal lines and they're a lot more, they're a lot, the particles are a lot closer together. So as, um, as water content increases in your soil, the clay soil structure becomes more dispersed or more kind of even out and layered. Um, and then also as your compaction increases, you go from a lower compactive effort to a higher compactive effort. You go from um, kind of highly flocculated to moderately flocculated or moderately dispersed to very dispersed. So you, you kind of get that more compacted and more platy soils. Um, 
So this can increase your horizontal hydraulic conductivity to an extent, but it definitely decreases your vertical hydraulic conductivity. Um, and uh, more compaction um, will help with that as well. Uh, so the moisture content is really the big deal in this case. Uh, this is uh, a figure we have in EM 1901 um, coming from LAD, developed in 1972. Uh, this shows that uh, even a small increase in water content can dramatically decrease your permeability. And so that's why in a lot of cases our specification ranges for compaction look at um, allowing the material to be compacted slightly wet of optimum rather than uh, dry of optimum. We tend to focus on maybe a minus 1% of optimum to plus 2% of optimum to get that um, well compacted, fairly low permeability material um, without altering the strength of the material by greatly increasing the permeability or greatly increasing the saturation and the uh, water content. So the anisotropy of embankment soils, um, excuse me, is uh, a lot less than and a lot tighter bands than natural soils. And Reclamation uh, has also compiled a um, uh, evaluation of that. So you can see for core materials um, using kind of standard and uh, USBR compaction procedures. And to be honest, I do not remember what's different between Reclamation's compaction procedures and standard everyday compaction procedures, but you can see that the anisotropy kind of decreases. Um, hydraulic fill, we have a few of those dams out there still. I know the core itself has some in our inventory that uh, anisotropy can be pretty great because, again, we're doing it in a layered system, um, and in hydraulic deposition, um, that layering is even more apparent. Uh, Reclamation also did the same thing for embankment shelves. Awesome. Sorry, I just saw a message and got distracted. Um, okay, so another um, important thing to take a look at is fine content. If you're looking at a clay soil um, or a silt soil, the type of fine can dramatically affect your hydraulic conductivity. So you can see, just taking a look at um, this one, you have clay, silt, loams, and then you have kind of uh, silica and limestone fines. So those are pretty... Um, low uh, plasticity fines, stuff like that. Uh, as, as the plasticity of the fines decreases, the permeability will increase. Um, so just looking at this example, if you're looking at 10% uh, fines, you have 10% clay fines your, um, versus 10% loam fines, your hydraulic conductivity will increase by an order over an order of magnitude at the same fines content. Um, and then to even further complicate things, you take a look at your clay fines, and the type of clay fines can actually affect your um, uh, void ratio, which will affect the hydraulic conductivity. Uh, or sorry, at the same void ratio, you'll have a different hydraulic conductivity. So at the same density, um, you can have a different hydraulic conductivity depending on your different types of clay fines. Um, and that's just because different clay particles are bigger than other clay particles. And so that will affect your hydraulic conductivity. Um, so, going over to coarse grain material, um, you want to take a look at the density and then the types of grains, whether or not you have angular or rounded grains. Um, however, this isn't as big of an um, effect as the fine fraction would have on your soil. So, if you take a look at this one, um, they did tests on C33 sand and they looked at rounded sand, rounded C33 sand and angular C33 sand um, at different porosities. And so as the porosity decreases, your permeability decreases. But taking a look at these um, uh, porosity, taking a look at these permeabilities, you can see there's not a dramatic change in permeability. Uh, this is a figure that's going to go in our new update to EM1901, um, and it just takes a look at hydraulic conductivity of the soils, various soil types versus void ratio. Um, and as the void ratio decreases, you can see um, one of these examples. So this material, the void ratio, um, as it decreases, you can see the hydraulic conductivity decreases. Um, and that makes sense because as you as your your voids get smaller, there's less space for the water to move. So 
uh, and a big um, consideration, uh, particularly for partially saturated soils and transient analyses, um, is the degree of saturation. Uh, so as your soil um, becomes less saturated, the permeability will actually go down, and it can go down quite dramatically. Um, so uh, when the degree of saturation is less than about 85%, Darcy's law is not applicable either. Um, but when the degree of saturation is greater than 85%, uh, most of the air present in your soil is in the form of small bubbles in the water. And so then you can uh, approximately apply Darcy's law, but you have to understand how your permeability changes with changes in degree of saturation. Um, so the air, as the degree of saturation decreases, so as, you're, as you lose water um, and you get more air, there's less space for the water to move and your permeability will go down. Um, and there's equations and relationships that you can include in your seepage model to, uh, to, to show this relationship. All right, so now we've talked about um, permeabilities, how permeability is affected, um, the equations that govern steady state flow. Um, and they're going to talk, look, now we're going to start talking about ways to solve Laplace's equation. Um, so there are uh, a few solutions that you can do. The first one is closed form. These were developed early on, uh, but they're only a applicable for very limited cases. So if somebody took in and out, they analyzed a certain geometry, and they told you what the results are. And they do it for different permeabilities. Um, and, they, and so you can pull in your permeability and you can look at the results. But again, it's for one specific case. So it's, it's really only applicable to that case. Um, so the graphical format of doing it, flow nets. How many, how many people have seen a flow net before, worked with flow nets? Oh, good. A large part of the class this week. Um, so I'm going to talk about flow nets, but I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, and then uh, numerical analyses, which is the most common these days. Uh, go on. Go on. Out. Oh, sorry. My dog joined me. Um, that's uh, finite element, finite difference. Um, I bet a lot of you have worked with uh, CW. CW is a finite element method analysis program. Um, Analogs, which I think are the coolest and I've never gotten a chance to do, but you can do electrical analog models, you can do viscous fluid models. So basically they set something up in the lab. Um, they have different, uh, in an electrical analog model, they have different uh, electrical resistivity paper and they just push electricity through your model to see how it behaves. So I've not gotten, I've never gotten a chance to see that or to do, perform one of those, but I thought it was kind of cool. Um, and then the method of fragments, um, how many people, how many, has anybody here done an evaluations using blanket theory for levies? A few people, yeah. <laughs> um, it's a method that the Army Corps developed in the 50s to evaluate levies, under seepage through levies, um, and they use the method of fragments um, developed previous to the 1950s. Um, it's a very useful method, um, and it's still used today in levy evaluations, but it does require simplifying your geometry, so it may not be useful in all cases. Uh, so I'm going to talk about flow nets. Um, I think flow nets are, understanding flow nets is very useful to understanding seepage. So even though we do most of our evaluations these days with numerical models, um, I find numerical models to be a bit black box at times, and I, I really want everybody who does seepage analyses to have a, a good background in flow nets and understanding flow nets and being able to sketch a very basic flow net. Um, when we do our our seepage uh, and piping, or I think it's just our seepage course, um, a prospect course that the Corps puts on. Uh, we actually have people drawing flow nets, um, and it's really helpful for them to figure out seepage analyses. Um, so in a flow net, uh, flow is represented by flow lines, and then total head is represented by equipotential lines. Um, for isotropic conditions, which is what a flow net is used for, uh, you have flow lines and equipotential lines intersect at right angles and they form what we call curvilinear squares, and I'll show those in a few minutes. Um, so some of the requirements that you must have for a flow net is the same amount of flow occurs through all flow channels. Um, the squares must be able to be subdivided into smaller squares. I'll show you that in a few minutes. Um, you must have boundary conditions well-defined, and you must uh, uh, observe those boundary conditions. 
And you must also know where your entrance, exit, and any deflection boundaries are. And I'll again go through those in a little detail. So here's a very simple model for flow that I'm going to show a flow net on in a, in a minute. Um, so one of the most important things for understanding a flow net is equipotential lines. Flow, flow channels to me make, make intuitive sense because you can see where water is going to flow. But those equipotential lines, it took me a little bit longer to understand. So <clears throat> these are kind of flow lines or equipotential lines through a soil. And uh, if you stick a tube down to each one to measure the water level um, at anywhere, any point along this line, the water will come up to the same point in that tube, um, indicating that the measurement is the same, uh, a measurement of head and, and piezometric pressure is the same along that line. So here's the very simple flow net sketched on this model. So you can see you've got uh, four flow channels, one, two, three, four. And then you've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine equipotential drops between this upstream, this upstream screen here and this downstream screen here. So um, that helps you divide the, uh, this, this area here into areas of equal head. So you can see your overall head drop between the, your head water and your tail water is equal to the number of equipotential drops times that change in head there. So that's a very basic one. Um, so we usually don't have, aren't that lucky to have that basic of a geometry, so we're not going to have perfect squares in all cases. So we have what are um, curvilinear squares. Um, so you can see this square right here between, like I said, uh, this point, three, four, and five. That's a curvilinear square. So if you, if you sketched a circle in here, it should be tangent to all points in that circle uh, or in that in that square. It should be it should be able you should be able to touch all four sides of that square, and that's how you can check that it's square. Another way to uh, make sure that it's square is if you sketch in additional lines and additional flow channels, uh, potential lines and flow channels, you get identical little tiny squares. You can see there's an identical little tiny square. So that's how you can check and make sure your your uh, squares is realistic. All right, so I'm going to throw a bunch of figures at you in the next few slides. But these are just some guidelines if you ever need to sketch up a flow net. These are just some guidelines on how to do it um, and how to tie in. So in this case, this is how you might tie in your um, seepage line to your entrance and how it might come out at the, at the exit of your dam or your, into, a, into a drainage feature or something like that. Okay. Um, here's an example. Here's some figures of how, and this is all done by Cassie Grandi in the late 30s. He was kind of the pioneer of flow nets. Um, he thought they were a great idea um, and argued a lot for their usage. So he developed a lot of methods to um, draw flow nets to make it easier for everybody else. Um, so this is how a seepage line would deflect at a boundary between soils of different permeability. So again, you may never have to do this, but if you do, these are some good uh, guidance, guidance on that. Um, here's an example of how flow, net, or how flow lines would be adjusted at the boundary between soils of differing hydraulic conductivity. Um, so the, uh, the deflection angle is related to the contrast between the two permeabilities. So over here, you're looking at going from a higher permeability to a lower permeability. And over here, you're looking going from a lower permeability material to a higher permeability material. So on the left, in this case, um, since you're going from a higher permeability to a lower permeability, to maintain the same flow rate or the same amount of flow through this flow channel, because that's one of the requirements of flow nets, um, you have to increase your flow channel size to accommodate that reduced hydraulic conductivity and allow for more flow. So that's that's how, and, and these equations here will help you do a proper deflection across those lines. Um, <laughs> this is always fun to show because uh, if you're not a fan of geometry, which I'm not, and doing geometric calculations, this looks mildly terrifying. 
But what Casagrande did um, is he developed a number of methods to sketch in a seepage line through an embankment. Um, so you don't have to guess and try to, to sketch it in and do it a bunch of different ways. Um, it, it's really just uh, geometric calculations based on the construction of the shape of a parabola. Uh, and it's pretty straightforward if you follow the steps. Um, so this is more details on the different, different uh, values you need, the different measurements you need. Um, when you're drawing a flow net, you're going to do it uh, to scale. So you're, you're looking at a piece of paper where it's all drawn to scale. So it should be pretty straightforward um, with the methods that Cassie Grande and others have developed. Um, and if you are really interested in this and actually need to develop a seepage line in a phreatic surface, EM1901 has some good guidance on that. All right, I'm almost done, I promise, and you can take a break before I start talking about more seepage. <laughs> um, so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we do flow nets for anisotropic soils. So as I mentioned earlier, um, Laplace's equation uh, is applied in graphical form. If you, have an, if you have an isotropic soil, you can draw squares and you draw, it has to be isotropic for you to be able to draw those squares. But we almost never have an isotropic soil. I think I mentioned that a few minutes ago. So they had to come up with a method to accommodate the, you know, the real world. So what they did um, when they developed flow net, Pasta Grande and others, is um, they discovered that if you adjust the scale of your cross section um, by this reduction here, um, you can draw a flow net, a normal flow net. So they took this section um, where your horizontal hydraulic conductivity is greater than your vertical hydraulic conductivity, and they reduce the horizontal dimensions, and so now you're able to draw a regular flow net on it. And then to get the accurate or get the flow net on the actual correct uh, section, you stretch the flow net back out and redraw it on your on your true section. Um, so here's uh, a, an example with KH is equal to four times your vertical hydraulic conductivity. Uh, here's that same one with your KH equal to nine times your vertical hydraulic conductivity. So you have a very skinny section, um, and then it gets spread back out to a much flatter looking um, cross section, or much flatter looking flow net. And that is all I've got for this round. 